You know, I'm not a sentimental guy, all right, but uh, I'm feeling very nostalgic for 16 years ago because it was 16 years ago this week that uh, the United States of America launched its, uh, its war of choice and aggression in Iraq, and uh, there's been a lot of commemoration of that event uh, in the public eye by, once again, attempting to rewrite history, attempting to make the case. Ari Fleischer, uh, George W. Bush's press secretary, was one of those doing it, uh, making the case that, gee, nobody could have known that there weren't weapons of mass destruction. Nobody could have known that this was a war of choice. Uh, certainly a lot of people in the media are doing the same thing, saying, you know, who who could have known? Who, who could have guessed that this was not going to be? Well, a lot of us guessed it at the time. A lot of us knew all along the way. And here to talk about the role of the media in uh, the run-up to the Iraq war and its instrumental role in creating that war is Matt Taibbi. You know Matt from his writing from his at Rolling Stone, from his books, from and well, Insane Clown President, his book on uh, Donald Trump, a great title there, uh, his book I Can't Breathe, uh, Killing on Bay Street, about the death of Eric Garner at the hands of New York City police, and uh, so many others, The Divide, Griftopia, a great derangement, and he joins us now. So, and his new book, I, which I has it, which I almost forgot to mention, Hate Incorporated, about the media, uh, which is very germane to the topic at hand. So, Matt, thanks for coming on back on the program. Thanks for having me on, Richard. So, yeah, I mean, obviously I wasn't being entirely honest when I said I feel sentimental about <laughs> 16 years ago. Actually, what I feel honestly is kind of bitter. Um, right. And uh, I feel bitter because uh, the media, you know, I we talked about it the last time you were on the show. I still feel a kind of naive idealism about the role of journalism in society, and I just feel that it could not have been more profoundly betrayed than it was in the run-up to the Iraq war, except by the way the media has behaved in the run-up to every war since then. But um, And I'm, ongoing about, about that deception, too. Yeah, yeah, and that I think is a great place to start, the deception, the meta-deception, the deception about the deception, which is really what I've seen a lot of this week, and you have too, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the sort of operating legend of the WMD mistake um, was that, well, how could we have known? Um, we believe the intelligence, they told us it was real, uh, it was an honest mistake, therefore, uh, you know, as, as David Remnick of The New Yorker said, uh, well, nobody got that story completely right. And, uh, and as a result of that, it, it, it's allowed this, this legend to pro proliferate that the case for war was made by people like Dick Cheney and uh, Donald Rumsfeld and Ann Coulter and a few people on Fox. And this whole other sort of segment of people in the commercial media who actually got on board pretty enthusiastically back then um, have found a way to wriggle free of, of that mistake and over time kind of smooth it over. And it's been very frustrating to watch. Well, and it's also been frustrating if you believe in any kind of moral order in the universe, and, <laughs> you know, because the people who were derelict in their duty as journalists, in my opinion, uh, only benefited from it. And the people, right. the people who struggled to tell the truth uh, were on the losing end of the stick. I do have to say regarding David uh, Remnick, by the way, that, he, that there's a, there, I had an English teacher in high school who is probably the only reason I'm a writer or maybe around today because I was going to be kicked out for uh, a drug use and things like that and and I, he, you and I have a lot in common it seems oh really okay well we'll talk but 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 mr downs stepped mm -hmm. in and passed around to the other teachers in the teacher's room and to the head of the school some writing of mine and said you know this kid has talent let's not give up on him mm -hmm. and um mr downs also encouraged david remnick to go into journalism so i guess it kind of zeroes out what he did for me no sure. i'm kidding yeah. 
but, yeah. but but he was a great guy and uh mr downs that is and i don't know remnick but why i don't remember david rem was the new yorker uh a, a strong voice for the war at the time. I was not sure exactly why Remnick chose to inject himself in this conversation in that well, way. Well, he, he, he was. He, he personally wrote a, an editorial called Making the Case, um, which hedged a little bit, but basically said that the um, that containment, the, a return to the, the hollow pursuit of containment would be the most dangerous policy of all. Um, but the New Yorker was also home at that time to Jeffrey Goldberg, uh, who w was very aggressively for the war. So even though there were there were some dissenting voices in New York, in New Yorker, um, like Rick Hertzberg, for the most part, the New Yorker, like like the bulk of really kind of the, what we tend to think of as the blue state media, um, they got they got on board. You know, the New Republic with Jonathan Chait. Um, the Washington Post, uh, its editorial page was just wall to wall uh, pro war editorials. Uh, the New York Times, I think everybody knows about the role that they played, which was actually kind of complicated because they they had conflicting sets of investigative reporters who were who were trying to say different things, but they they ended up landing on, on the side of um, of the war case. But the 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 really important thing about all of this is that it was all unimportant. <laughs> Everybody missed the real story, which was that the real reason for war had nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction. We now know, because of things like the Chilcot Report in Britain, that this was an excuse that was concocted uh, between Britain and the United States, basically to give the British political cover to support the invasion. The Bush administration their real reason was just regime change. We, they wanted to begin pursuing this new new vision of foreign policy, which we continue to execute today, which is this idea that we shouldn't have uh, nations out there that are not satellites of the United States. We should have a quote unquote preponderance of influence uh, over everyone. And you know, Iraq was where they wanted to start. And, and, uh, and we, you know, we have a pretty strong docu documentary record of this and WMDs were the excuse that was kicked up for the press and for the public. And so for journalists to say, oh, well, I was fooled by that, you know, by the WMD thing. Well, that, that means you missed the story and you were fooled. Uh, and, and so I, I think that part is, is important. Yeah, and I want to, I mean, there's a lot to dig into here, but in terms of what we now know about WMDs being, you know, the cover story, and I think even at the time, I'm a little hazy on my chronology now, but I think even at the time we knew that the Project for a New American Century had been advocating for regime change in Iraq since the late 90s. So it was, and a lot of those people went into the Bush administration. So it wasn't a huge shocker that they would lean in this direction. But as I recall, the one sort of overwhelming and irrefutable fact about uh, uh, the WMD argument at the time was that the weapons inspectors weren't finding anything and they weren't done yet finding anything. David Kay, who was down there, wasn't done. Both the UN inspectors and David Kay had to leave because we were about, to, just because we were about to start bombing. So if you have, forget everything else. If you have people on the ground saying they're not finding anything and they need to do a little more looking, but so far it looks all clear, and you say, no, you have to get out because we're bombing because of that thing you can't find. Right. That, that to me, is, am I missing something or doesn't that kind of say case closed? That's a, 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 you know, a BS reason to attack. Right, exactly. And this, this is why it's so frustrating to hear reporters say things like nobody got that story right because millions of people were out in the streets because we all, we all just did the math. It didn't take very long. Like, you know, none of these factors added up. This, this is a country that had nothing to do with with 9-11. Not only that, uh, Saddam Hussein uh, was the kind of secular Arab strongman who is hated by groups like Al-Qaeda even more than they hate, you know, the United States. The idea of a union between those two made no sense. 
They were telling us things like the war was going to be over in a matter of weeks, which was ridiculous. They were telling us that there, the threat of sectarian conflict between the Sunnis and the Shias was not serious and had been historically exaggerated. Um, so this idea, and, all, and especially the most, the, the craziest part was they were saying Iraq was a unique and exceptional evil. So they, they, when Bush gave his original axis of evil speech, they had not yet progressed to that argument. They, they said Iran, North Korea, uh, and Iraq were examples of a kind of rogue state that could potentially provide weapons to um, to a, a terrorist, but there are actually more countries on that list. And as we now know, even the, the intelligence analysts thought Iraq was, the word they used was unexceptional um, in this. And the public knew this. We, we, why Iraq? Why not some other country? Why, you know? And so we were all out in the streets protesting because the, the, the case didn't make any sense. And yet the, the media response was, well, no, it all makes sense. And, and you know, all we need to do is, um, is find the WMDs that they tell us are going to be there. And, you know, and as you say, the inspectors weren't finished. Like, why were we going in before the, if, if our reason was, the WMDs, why were we going in before the inspections were finished? Which the, the real reason was we didn't really care about the the UN Security Council or, or that entire UN inspections violation. We were we wanted to unilaterally go in. Britain want, didn't want us to. And so you're right. There, were, there was an open contradiction that 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 should have been visible to the press. And by the way, uh, you know, if you, in Great Britain now, as you know, Tony Blair is almost universally despised because people understand that he lied to get them into war. I mean, it, it, the, the sense of betrayal is still palpable. Mm -hmm. And I think his, I think the disapproval rating for Tony Blair is 80 something. And yet the approval rating for George W. Bush among registered Democratic voters is now above 50 percent. And right. to me, you know, let me put, I always go to like alien anthropologists of the future <laughs> way of studying a problem. When alien anthropologists land on our overheated husk of a planet, you know, eons from now and go back through the records of this period of time, how will they explain this ins cultural insularity that allowed people at the New Republic and the Jonathan Chates and so on, a, a lot of people who are now considered like uh, liberal democratic heroes, virtually the entire democratic uh, elected uh, membership of Congress in the Senate and so on, to band together to vote for and support and beat their chests in support of this delusion and uh, how has that sustained and protected itself against, you know, what is now becoming its obvious flaws and mistakes? It hasn't happened in England to quite the same extent, although I guess you have the same people running, you know, uh, the Conservative Party and trying to get the Labour Party back. But what is it that binds all these people together and protects them and allows them to do even better in the wake of such a catastrophic moral and intellectual failure? Well, the, the the first rule of the commercial media in America is you, you you you're allowed to make mistakes as long as you make them in concert with everybody else. <laughs> so it, it's it's very much a herd mentality. Um, you know, you, it's like those nature shows where you see a, a whole bunch of wildebeest standing. The instant fifty one percent of the wildebeest decide to run that way, everybody runs that way, and that's the way the press works most of the time. And so if you make a mistake, if you make a mistake with everybody else. It's forgotten. If you make a mistake on your own, that that's when suddenly your career is in trouble. And you know, there the, there's an insulated community. It, you know, the, somebody I used to know who worked in the Senate um, described the sort of Washington D.C. Northeast corridor culture of lobbyists, politicians, and journalists. He calls it the blob. Right? right. It's just a, thing where everybody there's intermarriage right people have spouses who work in government or, or in journalism and there's a kind of a, co a collective 
um, uh, you know, thinking that goes on. And this, that, that's what was so interesting about, you know, Brooke Gladstone of On the Media uh, years later said that the reason the reporters um, didn't protest against the Iraq war as much is, is because they, they didn't have political cover from Congress. If more people in Congress had protested uh, the war, then they would, have, they would have felt that they had the political cover they needed to come out and say what they actually thought about the war, which tells you a lot about how, how these people see themselves, because they, they see themselves as part of a thing and as team players, whereas, you know, we're really not supposed to think like that. We're supposed to be kind of outside the tent. And it's our job to take unpopular stances if we see something the wrong way. It's our, it's our job to make difficult calls. And I think that was what was interesting about Knight Ritter. You know, Knight, the Knight Ritter people, were, that was the only big news organization that didn't buy the war case. And when asked why they didn't, they said, look, our readers are different than the, than the readers of all these you know, Washington and D.C. publications, we, 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 our readers are the people whose kids are going to war. We have an obligation to them, you know, and, and so we thought of it from that perspective. And that's that's the way we should think. But unfortunately, that's rare. Yeah. And again, we're talking with Matt Taibbi, author of a number of books, including Hate Incorporated, his new book about the media, uh, his new serialized book about the media. So I, I guess, you know, this gets to... The whole notion, well, it could get us to a lot of things, but it gets us to the whole notion of the Overton window, right? The, uh, the idea that there is a window of acceptable political discourse and you can't stray from it to the left or to the right. And, you know, one of the things that the Bernie Sanders campaign did in 2016, moved it to the left for Democrats so that they're talking about Medicare for all. But other than that, almost exclusively, it's moved to the right over the last, really since Reagan, so 30, three or four uh, de decades. I was going to say centuries. It seems like centuries. But um, so we have this whole question of the Overton window. But, but as you were saying, Matt, uh, Reporters aren't supposed to be part of that. First of all, it's a, it, 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 it's a constraint on democracy that it even exists in politics. But journalism is supposed to be outside of that. It's supposed to be fact-driven. It's supposed to be go wherever the facts take you. Is it that? Did I just seriously misread uh, the, the kind of... Um, ambition and drive and ideals that leads people to be journalists. I really thought, and I'm a pretty cynical guy, but I really thought for a long time that people went into journalism because they just can't stand not knowing the truth. <laughs> you know, and you just got to know the truth. And if it means like going through dusty records in City Hall or pouring over your computer like obsessively or whatever, you just got to know what's really going on. And I feel like that's the last thing that most of the journalists reporting on Iraq wanted to know was the truth. They wanted more to sort of signal uh, the, their membership in the center of that wildebeest herd. Exactly. And, and and languish in the comfort of knowing that there are a lot of similar animals all around them. Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and what you're talking about is um, this kind of profound uh, problem that's infected the business over a long period of time, over over decades. Um, you know, when my father first went into journalism in the late '60s and early '70s as a teenager. Um, he, uh, you know, journalism was a place where you went if something went wrong in your life. Typically, <laughs> it, it was it was kind of a, a safety valve for people who kind of had that flopped out of college as lit majors or um, who were iconoclastic, had you know were difficult personalities. The people you found in journalism once upon a time. Tended, tended to be exactly the kind of personality that you described, this, this sort of person who just, just had to know, had an urge to kind of stick it to somebody, um, <laughs> did, didn't mind being alone, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, you know, m most, most good reporters, they tend to be loners. They tend to have problems getting along with people. Like, that, that, that was a, a, a character trait of a lot of really good journalists. And, you know, I, I, don't, have to, I don't have to name names, but you can think of some of the best investigative reporters from recent history and just imagine what they're like in private and you're probably right 
Um, right. But, I, I could. I'm, I can name one if I were so inclined right now, or at least one exactly. Or two. I yeah, think I yeah. Know what we're thinking of. Yeah. But, but the, <laughs> the, yeah, I think after all the president's men, uh, and there, you know, the, the journalism became kind of a sexy profession to get into um, in the '80s, maybe in the early '90s. And I, I saw this as a young person coming up in the business. I had an odd perspective because I had grown up in it, you know, it was my sort of my family business. And I saw that there were a lot of people actually more with my background, actually like upper class kids who went to good schools. This was a, a new wave of people who went to, went into journalism who weren't there before. Like you, you wouldn't have found lots of people from Ivy league colleges mm -hmm. um, in, 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 in throughout journalism, the way it is now. And that kind of person, they had a very different motivation for getting into the business. They were enthralled by the idea of being close to power. Um, and, you know, sort of the new paradigm was like primary colors, right? Like you, you were a person who, who got to be told the secrets uh, by, the, by the White House aide or the campaign aide late at night over a beer. And that was the thing that really excited you. But you, didn't, you weren't there to, to sort of you know, explode myths. You were there to be part of it, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's what happens. You, you, you end up becoming, you end up on the wrong side of the rope line and, and imperceptibly you don't realize that your allegiances have changed. And, um, and that's unfortunate because the, the, ultimately this business is really supposed to be, you're, you're supposed to represent your audience, uh, and not the people you're reporting on. And that gets flipped if you don't, if you're not careful. You know, and this is why I always use my uh, my alien anthropologist metaphors because it really is a social phenomenon, isn't it? That's what you're describing, and it also I was also fascinated by your observation about the fact that a lot of people from elite schools started coming into journalism, and I think I do see that the, uh, the reflection of that and the notion that somehow, it, it, you know, if you take, for example, Thomas Frank's uh, theory, which I do, and he's mm -hmm. been on the show a few times, that the Democrat became the, the Democratic Party, for example, became the party of the 10%, you know, the sort of professional class. Right. Um, then you see journalism become, you know, pay aside a kind of, uh, professional class position if you're, you know, a staff writer at the New Republic or wherever, and you see, you aspire to that kind of status, you expect that kind of status, you're no longer that, and I guess this is what you're saying, you're no longer, uh, and you've had the education of someone in that, that social cohort, you no longer have that alienated, uh, grizzled, you know, I have stone, you know, I'm going to you know, the hell with these bastards, I'm going to bring right, them yeah, back. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, so it, 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 so it's really interesting, but also deeply discouraging. And, um, and I guess I don't really know what the solution is. I mean, I think a lot of us uh, tried to, ch I know I did, uh, tried our best to challenge it at the time as vociferously as we could. And maybe I was you know, speaking for myself, a little too crude sometimes in my expressions of disapproval or a little too blunt. I, I did not signal in-group status either with my observations or with the language with which I presented them. But, you know, at least I was trying, and I think part of that was kind of trying to throw a brick through this window and trying to encourage others to do so. But, you know, maybe I've written things that I look back on and, you know, cringe a little bit. But, but the point was there, was, there was this horrible insularity, and I feel now, where it was naked back then, I feel now it's been obscured a lot, I think, by the advent of Trump. And so many people are saying, well, you know, Trump's such a singularly horrible historical figure that compared to that, none of these differences matter. It doesn't matter where you stood on Iraq. I think that's why a majority of Democratic voters, for example, now think well of George W. Bush, that and he gave yeah. Michelle Obama a piece of candy and all that. So I, 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 think, I think we've gone into a period of occlusion when it comes to the stark differences we try to lay out with these people. Does that make sense to you? Do you get what Absolutely. I'm driving at? Yeah. No, you, you, you hit the nail on the head. And 
you know, what Thomas Frank was talking about was exactly right. I've, I've talked to Tom about this, like the, the, you know, back in the day, if you opened up your date, your local newspaper, there was always, you know, somebody like, uh, you know, like Mike Loiko or, or, you know, Mike Barnacle or, you, you know, uh, trying to think of in New York who would be the, the you know, Jack Newfeld, whatever it was. There's right, always Jack Newfeld, for sure. Yeah. Grizzled, yeah. grizzled, like, working man. Like, even even the, the literary style was yeah. was the vernacular of, a, like, a regular person, right? right. Like, it, 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 was, it was language that was designed and aimed for a person who – you know, had a real job, who, who like had a tough job, you know, and, and it was designed to reach that person. Those voices are all gone now. They, they've all been replaced by professional class people. Um, and, and so the, there's, a, there's a new language of uh, the opinion page. Like, you know, a, a thing that you will see now, you know, a great example of the kind of person who becomes an opinion writer in America now is like Max Boot. You know, and uh-huh. and he, you know, he's a writer for the Washington Post, and he, he recently said, you know, like, what's wrong with being elitist? Like, wouldn't you, if you went to uh, a, a hospital, wouldn't you want the elite surgeon? You know, and and this is the perfect expression of how like the professional class thinks about things. Like, we're more educated; we just know, you know, like we're, we're we we know better, and it's it's not that that's inherently worse than anything else it just means that the the uh the point of view that that at least a big portion of the media used to have which was we represent sort of regular people and we're, we're going to be a bulwark against power and and challenge it and ask it questions um that's been confused now now there's there's a new thing where Journalists see themselves as, well, we have to be part of this sort of noblesse oblige structure up top that kind of tells people what what's good and what's bad. And especially in the age of Trump, as you bring as you, you bring up, they've actually accelerated that instinct now because they think, oh, this is the ultimate example of what happens when you let the rabble think for themselves, you know, and. And so it's gotten worse, I think. I think it, the press has alienated itself even more from from ordinary people, and I don't think that's the proper response to Trump. I think that's that, that makes it makes it worse. Yeah, and it, well, well, I totally agree. I feel Trump is, uh, Trump's election it was in large part a reaction against this kind of elite insularity that we're talking about in politics and the media, which doesn't mean that the only alternative is Trump. You know, there was a left alternative to that too, but the absence of that, uh, I would argue, led in large part to the, and many factors, but led in large part to the election of Trump. But now their reaction is, well, let's have even less of that possibility of a left alternative to Trump by banding together even more. But you know, Matt, that uh, this is a debate as old as the Republic itself, right? I mean, you had Hamilton talking about your, your rabble, sir, is a great beast. You know? right. and, and you had Walter Lippmann, the journalist Walter Lippmann, writing uh, public opinion in the 1920s, referring to voters as a bewildered herd who right. needed to be led by elites in uh, the public opinion business who would take their cues from elites in politics and business. So, I mean, this is an old struggle, but I guess in, in, in the you know minutes we have left, uh, how do we win it? Big question, but any thoughts? Well, I, I, I just think that the journal, journalists have to recognize that they're advocating their own power when they get into bed with politicians and see themselves as part of a larger power structure. They, they, I think there's a, there's a delusion um, that, that runs through all of this, is that a lot of these people think, oh, we're helping because um, we're going to help communicate the message that these are the appropriate policies and we're, we're going to help the, the right politicians do the right thing and, and be part of this, this whole governing structure. Whereas the instant you do that, you lose the respect of both your readers and the people in power. Like they, everybody ignores you now because you, you're, they, nobody's afraid of you. Uh, journalists have to kind of like work extra hard 
to stay out of the tent. And I think when they when they realize that you know by staying out of things, by by making sure that they're 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 seen that they both are and and, and are seen as separate from power, that they'll get their respect back from everybody. Uh, and that may take a while, you know, I mean, I, I think we're in a particularly low, low period in the history of the business right now. And it's going to take some, somebody to break through with some really good journalism to who's going to have to be really brave and, and really go against public opinion. Um, and, but, but right now reporters, they, they don't understand that their proper place is, is outside the system. And I guess I, I, I would just conclude by saying, I mean, I think that's really well said, uh, that the vacuum that you describe, that the, the absence of adversarial journalism, I think the public uh, senses its absence on a kind of intuitive level. And I think, you know, everybody in the media elite world is tearing their hair out about um, about uh, fake news and and that kind of thing, you know, the proliferation or supposed pro proliferation of uh, news from unvetted sources and uh, uh, but they never seem to draw the line back to the fact that there is an appetite for fake news that that challenges the status quo with mytholo you know mythical stories about chemtrails or whatever but that maybe they never seem to make the connection that maybe there's a market for that at least in part because people know both in the stories they tell and even in the prose styles they adopt, that they are not going to be the ones to challenge the status quo and bring them the truth. Does that make any sense to you? You're, you're, you're absolutely right. And, 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 you know, during the Trump campaign, you know, I, I watched Trump as he developed this strategy of pointing to us in the crowd and turning us into the villains. And, and he, he started to pick up on the idea that People hated us. People hated the media. They saw us as representatives of the elite. And, you know, he would point at us. We were all sitting there on risers behind rope lines and we looked like animals in a zoo. And, and you know, we're all dressed as uh, we, we look like what we are, you know, college graduates who, who, who don't visit, you know, many places in America very often. Trump picks up on that. He turns us into caricatures of sort of upper class urban snobs. And when I realized that he was doing that, I talked to people in the crowd and they all said exactly the same thing. They all, they all said like, you know, you, you people don't come out here. You don't talk to us. You don't listen to what we have to say about anything. Um, you, you don't represent us. And, you know, so screw you. We're you know, like, like the, the, the vote for Trump, you know, was, was very explicitly designed just to make us angry. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. like it was, it, it was designed to be a thumb in our eyes because for ignoring all sorts of things. And you're right. You know, I, I, I just think that the people have to recognize that a lot of this anger that's out there is just directed at the, at the, the, the coziness that people sense that goes on between journalists and, and people in power, the, the sort of idea of like Rachel Maddow interviewing Democrats and just sneering at people out there in the sticks, like they hate that, like viscerally, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, um, you know, it doesn't mean that they're right, but it, but it doesn't mean that we are either, you know, and, and so I, I there's something's got to get fixed there. And, and I think, I think you're, you got, you're got your finger on it for sure. Well, you certainly do too. And you talk about it a lot in your new book, which I encourage people to read, Hate Incorporated. So Matt Taibbi, as always, uh, great to talk to you. And, uh, you got, do you have something coming out about the anniversary of Iraq, by the way? I do. It's at, uh, at taibbi.substack.com. It's a, it's an essay called the Scarlet Letter Club. Uh, but it's sort of an appendix to Hate Inc., which is also going to come out in print uh, you know, early later this year. Um, and uh, yeah, you can also find me at RollingStone.com. You could have called it the Scarlet Letterman after like the prep school <laughs> kids who make the football team. But anyway, exactly. <laughs> right. okay. okay, Matt Tidy is always great to talk to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much.